a very good morning to all the attendees who have joined from India and Professor Yablonovich who has joined from Berkeley. A good evening to him because it must be somewhere late evening in US at that time. So today it's we have 9 30 p.m. here. Yeah, it's 9 30 p.m. Yep. So today we have all uh, gathered over here on this online mode to listen to a special public lecture by Professor Yablonovich on physics does digital optimization for machine learning, control theory, and backpropagation. And this special public lecture is being organized, uh, currently organized by the National Academy of Sciences India Daily Chapter and MHRD Institution Innovation Council, the India Alupadhyay College, under the ages of the DBG Star College program. And it is a customary introduce uh, Professor Yablon Rich, who's the director of the NSF Center for Energy Efficient Electronic Science, a multi-university center headquartered at Berkeley. He received his PhD degree in applied physics from Harvard in 1972 and worked for two years at Bell Telephone Laboratories and then became a professor of applied physics at Harvard itself. In 1979, he joined Exxon to do research on photovoltaic solar energy. And in 1984, he joined Bell Communication Research where he was a distinguished member of staff and also director of solid state physics research. In 1992, he joined the University of California, Los Angeles, where he was the North Prop Roman Chair Professor of Electrical Engineering. And then in 2007, he became Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at University of New York, Berkeley, where he holds the James and Catherine Law Chair in Engineering. He introduced the idea that strained semiconductor lasers could have superior performance due to reduced valence band effective mass. With almost every human interaction with the internet, optical telecommunication occurs by strained semiconductor lasers. He is regarded as a father of the photonic band concept and he coined the term photonic crystal. The geometrical structure of the first experimentally realized photonic band gap is sometimes called Yablonovite. In his photovoltaic research, he introduced the 4n squared that is called as the Yablonovich limit, light trapping factor that is in worldwide use for almost all commercial solar panels. His mantra that a great solar cell also needs to be a great LED is the basis of the world record solar cells. Single junction ones, which has a 29.1% efficiency. Dual junction, which has a 31.5% efficiency. Quadruple junction, which has more than 38% efficiency and so on. His startup company, Ethrotonics Incorporation, shipped over 2 billion cell phone antennas and he co-founded Luxra Incorporation, the originator and world leader of silicon photonics and now acquired by Cisco Systems. There is a two-dimensional photonic crystal in every Luxra silicon photonics chip, billions of which are in major data centers used by billions all around the globe. He is elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Inventors, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. He has been awarded several prizes, including the Benjamin Franklin Applied, IEEE Edison Medal, Isaac Newton Medal, and so on. The list is too long. He also has an ordinary PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and the Meckel University, and is an honorary professor at the Yanning University. With these words, before inviting uh, Professor Yablonovich to share his talk, I request uh, Professor Ajoy Khatak to kindly introduce all the attendees about the Nasi Delhi chapter. Over to you, sir. Right. Yeah. So, welcome all to the webinar that Dr. Manoj Saxena has introduced by Professor by the very famous Professor Yablonovich, whose works we have all read and has been of. The, this event is partially organized by the National Academy of Sciences India, Delhi chapter, and Dean Dural of Vadhyay College. I am Ajoy Gatak, formerly Professor of Physics at IIT Delhi, and I am associated with the Delhi chapter of the National Academy of Sciences India. 
So this event, as you all know, is coordinated from their home by Dr. Manoj Saxena and Dr. Gitika Jain, both associated with Delhi University. So the National Academy of Sciences was uh, founded by the famous professor Mignat Saha, and uh, it was in 1930, Professor Saha and others founded the Academy of Sciences with the objectives to provide a national forum for scientific interactions and a forum for publication of research work. Professor Saha was the founder, president of the Academy, now known as NASI. So he was a great physicist and a great institution builder. And uh, we, are, we are indeed very fortunate to have a person like him in our country. So it has a large number of chapters, and Delhi is one of them. With this, I now request Professor Yablunavich to deliver his lecture, to which all of us are looking forward to. Dr. Saxena, would you like to say any more thing? Uh, yes, sir. I think I've just made Professor Yablunavich the presenter. Yeah. Yeah, so you can just stop sharing. Uh, uh, what do I do? You just press escape and then you can just stop sharing. Yeah, fine. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> yeah, you can share your screen, sir. Yeah, I'm having some difficulty uh, uh, sharing. Uh, just a second. Okay, I'm now the presenter, wonderful. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I hope you can see uh, my uh, title uh, shot there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me commence. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. I noticed that there are hundreds of people out there. And it's my great honor to uh, address you and uh, share with you what ha is very exciting in science. Now, the type of science I will describe is a combination of mathematics and physics. And uh, so uh, I have my co-authors and uh, one of them, the most important one is Sri Vadlamani, who is a graduate of uh, IIT Mumbai. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, optimization. This is a very big part of human effort. But I'm going to, uh, before I get into the optimization, I want to uh, show you some examples where optimization was very practical. So I, as you heard in the introduction, I was the co-founder of a company uh, called Luxterra. And Luxterra makes uh, communications chips, optical communications chips that are used at data centers. And if you use emails uh, or do web downloads, indeed, if you uh, use WebEx, as we're all using, you're going through a, a data center. And so Luxterra sold millions of chips in the data centers. The data centers have billions of individual users. And uh, every one of those chips has a photonic crystal inside. So I can safely say that a good fraction of humanity has photonic crystals every day. Let me show you uh, the first the quickly the product because you're wondering what it is, what are they doing? They have what's called optical active cable. It looks like a USB cable, uh, but it has the connectors are a little bigger. So these are electrical connectors, but the cable itself is uh, uh, is optical. So you go from the electrical plug, you convert inside the plug, you convert to optical, and this long yellow cable is all optical. So uh, let me describe one of the important functions inside uh, uh, that uh, connector or that uh, cable connector is that there is a, a very important function for optical communication, and that is that uh, you need to separate the two polarizations because when uh, light goes through an optical fiber for telecommunications, it breaks up into the two polarizations. Uh, they need to be treated separately, detected separately. And so there needs to be a component to do that. And so uh, this component has worked out to be a two-dimensional photonic crystal. Let me show you what it does. It's like a grading coupler. So you have this, these uh, uh, elements in a line. These are these elements here. And uh, they send 
one polarization, one direction, but equally you have uh, lines going through the same elements in, in the perpendicular direction, and uh, they send the light, the light out in that direction. So once you go out in the opposite directions, you can have separate detectors and so forth. This is an example of what happens in these silicon photonic chips. You have here a grating coupler. Uh, the light beam comes in from an optical fiber. It gets uh, coupled into a very thin film on the surface of the silicon, ends up in a waveguide, and it's a way of going from the relatively macroscopic world of optical fibers to the world of uh, waveguides on uh, silicon. And this is sort of a picture of how it works. So, but you need to split the two polarizations. So inside the chip is this very strange shape that looks a little bit like a leaf maybe, or maybe like a diamond. And how do you know that that's exactly the right shape that you need? So you have to do optimization. And you try to arrange that very little light is lost. All of the light goes in either one or the other polarization direction. So you have a figure of merit and that's the insertion loss. And, and by the way, we're using this right now because we're speaking on WebEx and this is going through data centers, many data centers on the way to uh, India. So uh, how do you do, how do you optimize a shape? So here is something that you did not learn in your calculus course. Maybe in your calculus course, you learned that to optimize a function, you could take the derivative. So imagine you have a function and when you reach the, the uh, peak of that function, the, the derivative is zero with respect to some of the uh, design variables. Well, what if you had to uh, determine a shape? To determine a shape, there are many, many uh, possible uh, degrees of freedom that you have to adjust. It, it, so how do you simultaneously optimize so many elements at the same time? So uh, let me show you an example of that. This is a problem I gave to a and that is to design a splitter, that is to say that the, there's one waveguide coming in and two waveguides that come out. And so that the splitter will have uh, as little excess loss as possible. So the lowest insertion loss again. And uh, this, the, uh, this is a relatively simple problem because uh, you're simply designing the width of this uh, waveguide and how it should be tapered. And you see the taper is rather strange. It's, I would say it's a rather non-obvious uh, taper, but uh, to define the taper only requires about 20 um, uh, degrees of freedom have to be adjusted, namely the, just simply the width, uh, the width of uh, this waveguide. And it's still a rather challenging problem because uh, uh, even uh, two degrees of freedom are very difficult to optimize because uh, let's say you, you adjust one, and then it's good, and then you adjust the other, and then that's good, but then you have to go back to the first one, readjust it, and you have to go back and forth, and sometimes you end up with a good design, and sometimes not. That's with only two variables. If you had 20 variables, you can imagine, you would, even if you change one, you have to then uh, uh, repair the other 19, so it's, it's actually a very difficult optimization problem. Let me show you the uh, video again of the iterations. There are successive iterations uh, and, and as you go through these successive iterations, uh, you, uh, you end up coming up with a very good shape. In fact, that splitter is 98.9% efficient, which is extraordinarily good and actually was a record in its time. And uh, so this is an example of optimization. This is exactly the type of optimization that is used for the uh, polarizing beam splitters uh, in silicon photonics. Now, uh, the so you, this is you have a problem. You've learned in calculus that you can optimize one variable, and I showed you here how to optimize a single variable. You take the derivative with respect to x, and you go to where the derivative is zero. But what if you have many many variables that you have to optimize at the same time? Then it's rather challenging, and what you learned in calculus is not enough. Uh, you need something extra. And the extra part is uh, represented here. This is a mathematical method that combines calculus with linear algebra. And you're trying to get the derivative of a shape with respect to uh, 
20 parameters, 1,000 parameters, even a million parameters are not that difficult to uh, calculate. And uh, this is uh, part of the secret, is that if you can solve Maxwell's equations twice, so uh, for example, you do a normal Maxwell simulation, uh, so you, don't, you simply uh, do the Maxwell simulation, you get the solution, this X represents electric fields, and then you do the what's called the adjoint simulation, and you, essentially as if everything's running backwards, and you get those electric fields, and you combine that with uh, the uh, thing you're trying to optimize. And with only two Maxwell simulations, you can actually get the derivative at a million points in space. So this is a fantastic mathematical method. Uh, we call it the adjoint method because there's a step in which you need the adjoint solution. That's what this transpose represents. So I hope all of you are learning your linear your, your linear algebra course very well because it's very very important. It's equal to uh, your calculus course, and if you combine the two, then you're able to optimize uh, functions of millions of variables so that you optimize you co-optimize them all at the same time, which is not very obvious to do and was not really uh, understood or known until the 1950s. So it's only about 60 years old this method. But it keeps, it keeps getting rediscovered in different fields. So although we call it the adjoint method, it has many names. Uh, for example, in artificial intelligence, you need to uh, optimize a matrix. There are many matrix elements, and uh, they have a different name. They call it back propagation, but it's exactly the same mathematics. I'll give you another example from my own personal experience. I started a company. Uh, to uh, design uh, the uh, the um, uh, the negatives that are used to print transistors on chips. So uh, the the negative is called a mask, and it is basically uh, the, uh, the the photographic process. The chips are made by photography, and it's called photolithography. And uh, but basically, uh, what's not clear is what the um, uh, what the negative should look like. And uh, so that becomes an optimization problem. Let me show you the solution. So let's say you're trying to get this structure on the chip, and this, these are parts of the transistor. And they say, well, uh, maybe the negative should look just like the transistor, but it's uh, just the negative of that. But actually, it looks very, very strange. I think in uh, 100 years, you would never guess that this would be the exact right shape. So again, it's an example of shape optimization. In this field, it's not called back propagation. It's not called the adjoint method. It's called inverse lithography technology and was only adopted about uh, 10 years ago. And every uh, microprocessor chip is using this now to um, for the manufacturing process. And I think you'd have to agree, this is utterly non-intuitive. And uh, now, if you've ever heard of metasurfaces, this is before there were metasurfaces. This was already a metasurface because these things are usually made of chrome on uh, glass. So uh, the solution is totally not obvious. Uh, you see the solutions, the optimizations are different depending upon which generation of technology you're using. And uh, so this is early examples of optimized metasurfaces. The main point, it's non-intuitive. You simply have to use mathematics to arrive at these uh, shapes. That's another example of optimization, how important it is. Now I'm going to show you other examples of optimization. It's an overwhelming part of everything we do with science and um, human effort. Uh, we're always trying to optimize. And I mentioned artificial intelligence, deep learning, back propagation. That's a, an optimization problem. You, you uh, uh, well, it's for example, in computer vision, you optimize uh, some type of filter that knows that this is a dog and this is a cat. And uh, that would be an example. Uh, laying out wires in a circuit, that's an optimization problem. Packing boxes. And uh, maybe uh, some of you have, uh, have uh, packed the, uh, uh, the trunk of a car and, and you couldn't fit everything in there. You have to try many different ways of getting it in. And so packing is an optimization problem. Uh, protein folding. So here's biology, a very important question. Biology, you have the protein molecules. Uh, the chain doesn't tell you much, but once they're folded, 
you, you learn more about the biology, but it's complete. The, and the protein is simply trying to minimize energy, but it, it, it can be like the boxes, it can fold in many different ways. So it's hard to know. And also control theory. This is a robot playing the violin and uh, it's uh, rather challenging and it's, um, uh, it uh, tries to play the notes and that's sort of an optimization problem as well. Now, oh, here's some more examples. Uh, the very famous traveling salesman problem. Here's a salesman, and he has a uh, has to visit customers all around the United States. And the question is, what is his what is his shortest path around the United States? That is a very famous unsolved problem, and you have to optimize it, find the shortest path. Um, aerodynamic optimization. You can imagine the shape of the vehicle. Uh, this is a little less obvious, but in finance, you have to optimize. A portfolio, obviously, to make money. There's a very famous mathematician in the United States, uh, Jim Simons, who is one of the wealthiest people in the United States because he applied mathematics to Wall Street and became extraordinarily wealthy. And actually, his biography was published uh, last November. A very interesting story. It's it's science. It's mathematics. Uh, and then you have airplanes for optimizing scheduling. And uh, bridges, for example, how do you build the strongest bridge with the least amount of weight and least amount of material? So this, these are examples, more examples of optimization. And I gave you the earlier examples in my own uh, experience of starting companies. So uh, what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is that, yes, there is mathematics. It's pretty good, but actually physics does optimization all the time. Why don't we use physics to do the optimization? And I will show you some examples, if only we could figure out how to use it. So uh, here's an example, uh, and it's a very famous principle in physics. It's called the principle of least action. Maybe some of you have heard about this, but this is usually not covered in elementary physics. It's very advanced physics. It uh, sometimes it goes all the way into particle physics or um, quantum mechanics, but it's it's present in all branches of physics. In principle of least time, it says the light ray uh, tries to follow a path that takes the shortest time. But uh, let me give you an example of uh, taking the shortest time. Suppose you're a lifeguard and you see a swimmer is in trouble out here in the water. And uh, you have to try to save the swimmer. And, and the lifeguard can run faster on the sand and uh, swim is slower, so the, the speed of swimming is slower. Uh, this is like n; it's like a refractive index. And so the the uh, lifeguard will go as far as possible along the sand, and then jump into the water to save the swimmer. And the uh, uh, is trying to get there as quickly as possible in the least time. And then the path will be like the refraction of a light ray where you go uh, through air, and then once you enter a slower medium like glass, uh, the light ray bend. And it's uh, very analogous to that. So that's the principle of least time, which is actually the same as the principle of least action. And that's something that uh, if you know Snell's law, uh, well, there's a minimization principle associated with it. And that's rather interesting. So here physics tries to minimize something. And if only we could find how to use it. So. I will give you five other examples of how physics does optimization. So uh, here's a, another example. This is one I'm very fond of. And this is the principle of least power dissipation. And But there's a very fancy way of calling this. It's sometimes called least entropy production, but it's just fancy talk for uh, the, uh, you try to achieve the least power dissipation. So suppose you had a circuit, uh, both arms are identical, but for some reason, one arm of the circuit has twice as much current as the other arm, uh, which is uh, a law. And yes, because nature doesn't like that. So if you wait a little while, eventually the currents will equalize. And the equalization means that you'll actually dissipate less power in these resistors when the two currents are equal, because if you have one current much larger, then the power dissipation is I squared R, and overall you're going to dissipate a lot more power. 
So here is a rather uh, simple example where circuits try to adjust themselves to optimize the power distribution, to minimize it actually. And so if we could use physics to solve these very difficult optimization problems, we would uh, have a great advantage because optimization is huge. It's a, a major part of being human. We're always trying to optimize things. Uh, here's another uh, principle. It is it is called first to gain threshold. It is, now you have to know something about lasers or oscillators, but you can imagine uh, that uh, there are many uh, possible, um, uh, maybe you have modes, optical modes or configuration, and one configuration has the lowest loss, and the other configuration has slightly higher loss. And so you, you turn on the gain, and let me run this video again. You turn on the gain, and the one that has the lowest loss is eventually going to capture all the energy. Uh, so you have many modes, but eventually all the energy goes into one mode. And uh, this seems like that would also be you're, you're, you're finding, you're optimizing, or you're, at least you're finding the optimal configuration that has the lowest loss. So that's another mechanism. Uh, here's another mechanism in physics. Uh, now, I don't expect you to know it because it's more advanced quantum mechanics. It's called the variational principle. And what it says, if you have the wrong wave function, that it will, the, the physical system will readjust itself and try to get to the true wave function. And uh, so that has a famous name. It's called the variational principle. And uh, to get this sort of nature, it gives it to you for free. That's kind of interesting. And then I have another physics mechanism, and it's called the physical annealing. It says that any system wants to go to a state of lowest energy. These are all the possible solutions on the horizontal axis. And but you start with a, a, a state of very high energy, and then you go down, and you might get trapped in a local minimum. But since there's still some temperature, you're not very cold yet. You jump out of the local minimum and you find the global minimum. So that's a very, um, uh, that's something we all learn all the time is that systems try to achieve the lowest energy. And uh, that is a possible way of solving a optimization problem. Uh, now, here's one that's a little bit more complicated. And uh, it's, um, Something that you, that you can, it's easy to visualize if you can think of electrical circuits. Often in electrical circuits, we have LC resonators and they have their own frequencies. So on the vertical axis, you have your own frequencies. And, and sometimes they're, they're like separate oscillators. And so it's very easy to determine each frequency and you can find the one that has lowest frequency. Then you turn on the interactions. There are coupling inductances. And then it's very hard to know what is the configuration with the lowest imaginable frequency. But there is something called the adiabatic principle. And what it says, as you turn on the interactions, uh, the uh, frequencies will repel each other. They'll avoid each other. You'll have an avoided crossing. And the one that was the lowest will still be the lowest afterward, uh, because uh, in the avoided crossing, the low one stays the low one. Now, this avoided crossing is very famous in quantum mechanics, but it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It occurs also in circuits. It's a purely classical phenomenon uh, that um, we could possibly take advantage of. So this is a very famous method. Now, it has various names. In quantum mechanics, it's called the quantum annealing. And it is uh, proposed as a useful method. Uh, but, uh, but it's actually, there's nothing quantum mechanics. But they, they think of it as being a quantum computer. But it, uh, I think that's uh, uh, a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, here's sort of an example, a more complicated example. You have many states, and no matter what you do, as you turn on the parameters, you go from a, an easy problem to a hard problem. And as you go, you if you're in the ground state, you stay in the ground state. So you can find the ground state configuration of uh, a very complicated physical system. So I think I've run out of physics examples where physics does optimization for us. And so the real question is, Okay, wonderful. Physics will do all this work for us. Uh, how will we use it? Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, people like is they like digital answers. 
And for that, we can use a bistable elements. A bistable element would be, for example, a flip flop. And you could have many of these flip flops connected together by resistors in such a way that it is representing a very difficult optimization. Uh, but uh, because the elements are themselves bistable, you will get a digital solution, which is what people look for because we're living in the digital world. So don't think of it as an analog computer. Think of it as being just as digital as a flip flop. And uh, so that's one way of uh, assembling it. And so let me summarize then what we said. We've given six examples from physics where physics will do the optimization for free. You don't have to use such complicated mathematics that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, so then, then the question is, wh what is the best physical method to do this? And so I will, I will tell you the answer. It's the it's this one, least power to station. The reason I say that, of course, nobody knows for sure which is the best method, but most papers have been published on that method. So uh, let me show you uh, what the characteristic problem. They like to solve a problem of interacting magnets. And you can imagine having a kitchen table and being a child and putting uh, magnets on the kitchen table and they and what is the lowest energy configuration of those magnets? And some of them will be uh, up and some will be down. And it's, quite, it's rather hard to get the optimum configuration, particularly if there are many magnets. So this is a very famous problem in physics. It's called the uh, Ising problem, named after a German scientist. And uh, it is regarded as extremely hard uh, to find the exact lowest energy configuration. And the way the energy is written is that uh, these um, sigmas, they represent whether the magnet is up or down. Uh, they're written by minus one or plus one. And then the JIJ is the interaction between the magnets. So this is a very famous, essentially unsolved problem. So let's try to solve it using physics. So I will give you a sort of prototypical example of a solution is that uh, you could start with oscillators, radio frequency oscillators, inductors and capacitors, and they will oscillate. And let's say you have two of them, two LC designators. And, you can, and by themselves, they're very easy to solve. They were just oscillators. But if you connect them with resistors, as shown, if the resistors are parallel, then the two oscillators will be in phase. And if, they're, uh, if the resistors are crossing one another, then uh, the uh, two oscillators are out of phase. So it's just like the magnets. These oscillators uh, are representing magnets, which are either up or down. And they could be uh, ferromagnetic. So ferromagnetic is the resistors are parallel. Anti-ferromagnetic coupling is if the resistors are crossing one another. And then you can visualize a problem as you have, uh, in this case, you have 32 LC circuits and the all these beautiful colors are just representing all the connections between uh, these uh, 32. 32 is already an interesting, I think it's very really hard, 32, but it gets harder. And I think the blue color and the red color are representing uh, ferromagnetic coupling and anti-ferromagnetic coupling. That is to say, the magnets won't be parallel or anti-parallel. So that's sort of an example. Uh, and what you're and what you're trying to do is to minimize the power dissipation. It's just in the course of minimizing the power dissipation, the uh, the uh, phases of the oscillators will adjust themselves to be correct to solve this problem. So this is rather amazing. Now, uh, let me indicate how this happens, is that uh, these oscillators, there are various ways of pumping the oscillators. One is called uh, parametric uh, pumping. It's actually quite simple. You modulate the capacitance at twice the frequency, and this produces gain at the actual frequency. You modulate it to omega, you get gain at omega, but what the gain does it drives you either to plus cosine in the complex plane, that's where plus cosine is, or minus cosine, uh, that's where it is. So it's bistable. It's a way of creating a bistable system. And uh, so uh, that's fine. And it has the property that the cosines will grow and saturate up. And the red is the uh, uh, in-phase cosine, and the blue is the out-of-phase cosine. 
and then they don't worry about the signs; they kind of disappear in this configuration. So it's a it's a way of making a, a nice bi stable system like a magnet. And uh, so uh, that's what you do. And you, this is how you set up the circuit. I think I've already shown you this. And uh, you try to arrange that the power dissipation should have the same functional form as the icing energy. This is a subtle point because you think power and energy are the same. No, they are not. Uh, the energy is the energy. That's the magnetic energy. And you're obligated when you design the circuit that the power dissipation should look just like the energy. And if the two of them look the same, then you can use power dissipation to solve the problem. Because nature, in addition to trying to achieve the lowest energy, is also trying to achieve the lowest power dissipation. And that, and it's easier to pursue power dissipation. So uh, now one of the things about uh, optimization, I have a digression. I think this digression might be useful for the students. Uh, is that anytime you do optimization, there are usually constraints. And so there's a, a famous thing you're supposed to learn in your, uh, maybe in your more advanced courses, is called Lagrange multipliers. But I have a graphical way of showing what a Lagrange multiplier is. So let me do this graphically. Uh, and it comes up in optimization. So suppose you're trying to reach an optimum of these ISO contours in blue. These are the blue ISO contours. And they reach an optimum right there. That's your optimum. And so you say, well, you, you, you go up the, the gradient. You follow the gradient. That's why we wanted to calculate gradients. And the, finally, the gradients converge onto the point that's optimum. It's like the top of the mountain. You converge on the optimum point. But in most cases, there is something preventing you from getting to the optimum, a constraint that you can optimize, but you have to satisfy your constraint. And that's indicated here in red. So you can never get to the optimum because you have to be somewhere on this red curve. So how close can you get? Well, you can get up to that point. Okay, at that point, you're, you're close to the optimum, but you're still on the red curve because you were constrained on the red curve. So if you take the gradient of the merit function, there's the gradient, and you have a vector going inward, and you say, well, wait a minute, it's tangential to the constraint function. This is, well, uh, the gradient of the constraint function is pointing exactly equal and opposite. Uh, not exactly, not equal, proportional. So that the uh, gradient of the constraint function is proportional with a minus sign of proportional to the gradient of the constraint. And the proportionality constant is actually the Lagrange multiplier. And this is the rationalization of the multiplier. Instead of optimizing the merit function by itself, you optimize the combined function, the merit function f, and combined with the constraint function g, and you have to also uh, optimize uh, this uh, lambda. Lambda is the Lagrange multiplier. That's the reason why we use Lagrange multipliers in, in doing optimization. So I hope this is helpful to you. I have to tell you, when I was in college, nobody taught it to me this way. Uh, and um, I find this to be a much more uh, direct way of understanding uh, the Lagrange multipliers. So what is the point? Is these physical things easily satisfy constraints, and so they can do a constraint on the Lagrange multiplier optimization. They do it for free. You don't have to do any programming uh, or very little programming, and you just let the physical system solve the problem. Uh, so an example is that you follow the Lagrange function. You take the gradient and keep taking the gradient. And then finally, when the gradient is zero, you have reached your global optimum. Or if you're climbing a mountain, when the gradient is zero means you've reached the top of the mountain. And uh, that's achieved when the gradient of the combined merit function plus constraint function is equal to zero. And that's the secret of the going multiplier. So I'm going to now show you that this has already been done. These physical systems have already been done. And I'll show you um, at least five examples. Each of the examples, these are very creative people, but each of them is very jealous of what they have created. They're, they are each is quite convinced that their way is the only right way of doing it. And, um, but what I will try to show you is they are, they are, they have no magic secret. 
they are uh, inadvertently and unknowingly following the physics of minimum power dissipation. And this is done by my colleague at Berkeley, uh, Roy Chowdhury. And he has a bunch of oscillators. Uh, he calls them uh, subharmonic injection, but it's similar to the second harmonic I showed you a couple of slides ago. And it's a similar idea. You'll get zero phase, 180 degrees phase, and you'll get that configuration. And it'll reach, the, they're connecting with resistors, it'll reach the point of minimum power dissipation, and that will be the solution. So it's uh, quite remarkable that this happens and it does. He's made the circuit and simulated the circuit and simulated more complicated circuits. Uh, I believe they all work on the principle of minimum power dissipation. And he has a merit function, which is the magnetic energy, but he also has a constraint function that everything has to line up with the uh, uh, locking frequency and that indeed he is doing minimum generation. Now he thinks he's doing something different and special, but in fact, my claim is that he's doing that and not only him, but all the others. So let me show you another one. This is from Cambridge University and they are not using the circuits. They're using what they call polaritons, but the polaritons are actually just uh, electromagnetic cavities. They're little electromagnetic cavities. Uh, there's no point calling them polaritons. Uh, if, if, if there's a problem in our field is that people think that if you if it's more sophisticated, if you use a more sophisticated name, I think the opposite, truly sophisticated, you reduce it to a simple element. Uh, the simplest element is just the cavity. Uh, the cavities interact and they lock into phases. And uh, so it's um, it's rather similar to what I showed you, is that it will try to minimize the power dissipation in the cavity. Rather uh, remarkably uh, so. Uh, the power dissipation ends up being uh, sort of electric fields and uh, couplings between electric fields. And you have a constraint. You cannot allow the electric to go to infinity. You want digital answers and you want to constrain it. That's enough. If you constrain it, uh, you'll end up getting the minimum entropy generation subject to the digital constraint. So this is a constraint. Each cavity has unit electric field. Electric a unit power of That's another example. That's from Cambridge University. Don't tell them that they're not using polaritons. They will become angry. Okay, here's a yet another one from the scientific literature. This is by Professor Yamamoto of Stanford, but actually he is himself, he's very personally influential in Japan. Many people working on this concept. And uh, what it is, it is, um, uh, it's called, well, it's a parametric pump. It is very similar to pumping at double the frequency and you get time slots. So each mode is a time slot uh, circulating around the optical fiber. And these modes are actually mutually in phase or mutually out of phase. And so in this way, uh, you, you, it starts to look like the uh, magnetic problem. And uh, he got he causes them to interact by extracting a pulse, re reinserting the pulse later on the on the ring, and uh, it's a rather nice idea. But at the end of the day, he is minimizing the power dissipation, or a fancy way of saying minimum entropy. So uh, this is what he is minimizing. Uh, there's uh, some nonlinear stuff happening, but uh, you have a constraint. And at the end, it's minimizing the power dissipation uh, essentially uh, is with the same method essentially as we're going to multiply it. Uh, here's yet another one. I hope you don't get tired. I only have, um, I think, one or two more of these physical methods. Each of these groups thinks they're unique and special, and only they have the secret for it solving these problems. Uh, but you see that they're actually all rather similar. So here's one that looks very different though. And this is um, taking advantage of an observation by, it's an old observation by Professor Zeilinger, a very famous professor from Vienna, Austria. And he noticed that if you used uh, beam splitters or more, the more modern way, two by two couplers in a, a silicon photonic circuit, that if you combine them, you can do arbitrary uh, matrix operations. 
So let me show you why. A two by two coupler has two inputs and two outputs. So it's already a two by two matrix. If you put many of them together, it becomes an arbitrary reward matrix. And you can do arbitrary matrix operations. Now, as you do those matrix operations, you can maybe uh, uh, take the output, maybe saturate it, send it through some nonlinear function, then send it back in and start again in the same matrix multiplier, the matrix multiplier being the silicon photonic circuit. And so each of these is an iteration and an optimization. Each circle around is one step toward the optimum point. And this is indeed simply an iterative algorithm, uh, but we've shown that actually uh, this is just minimizing the power dissipation as you go around and around in the circle. They, they will object to this fiercely. They claim that they're doing something different, but in fact, uh, uh, that's what they're doing. And they have a, a merit function and a little constraint. It's quite similar to what we've seen before. So that, oh, by the way, this is from MIT. They have two competing startups that have been financed, businesses that have started to commercialize this for optimization. And there's at least a, a, a third startup. So amazing that there could be uh, three startups using this one approach. Very interesting. Of course, a startup represents the investment of uh, millions of dollars and the dedication of some of the smartest young scientists as they, uh, they get swept up in it. Uh, this is, uh, okay, this one, I think is the last one. There, there are others I could show you, but this one is from our group. I've shown it to you already. It's, it's two oscillators connected by resistors that might be parallel, or might be crossed. And once again, the power dissipation follows the constraints and also follows the energy formula. The particular cases that we've done it would be uh, 32 spins, that's to say 32 LC oscillators, but totally interconnected, which is rather unusual. It's a lot of connections. It's two to the 31 connections. Uh, and uh, there are also uh, 2 billion possible solutions in this case. Now, uh, because it's only 32, we can actually do find the optimum by exhaustive search. There's the optimum. Uh, you reach an energy of minus 130 in these J units that I've used in J. And so uh, that's the nature of the action problem. You have to find that lowest energy state. And uh, so, but where we know it from exhaustive search, let's see if the machine will do it for us, the machine being the circuit. And once again, the, the blue and the red colors, I hope you can see them, they represent uh, crossing resistors and parallel resistors. It would be anti-ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic uh, coupling that are being modeled there. So what happens is you you have uh, some noise input, you let the oscillators run, and um, now what, at what frequency? These oscillators are running at one gigahertz, and they have a bandwidth of 100 megahertz, so it's 0.1 gigahertz bandwidth. So uh, that bandwidth corresponds to about 10 nanoseconds. So uh, you let the system run, it will automatically find its optimum where it minimizes power dissipation. And after about 300 nanoseconds, nanoseconds, it already has locked into the optimal configuration, which is quite amazing. This is uh, locking into positive phase or locking into negative phase. So uh, that's totally amazing. Now, they, you, in effect, this has searched through 2 billion possible solutions. And in 30 clock cycles, this is 300 nanoseconds. If we have 10 nanosecond uh, clock periods, that would be the bandwidth of the oscillators. It means in 30 clock periods, you've already solved the problem where you have to select from uh, 2 billion possible solutions. So uh, that's uh, probably amazing. And also, uh, how you actually implement it, you gradually increase the gain. And as you increase the gain, you, you lock into the desired configuration. So uh, this is a little bit more than how it locks in. At first, it's very noisy, and finally, all the oscillators are locked in. And this would be a uh, spin up this from the magnet up and magnet down. So it's uh, quite amazing. So uh, thank you for your patience, because I've now shown you five completely different machines, uh, each 
the, the group behind each machine thinks they're doing something rather unique, but in fact, they're all doing pretty much the same thing. They're using a physics principle, which is the principle that any circuit will organize itself to minimize the power dissipation. And that's how you achieve an optimum, and you could accompany this with constraints. So it's the launch multiplier optimization for free from the physics. And so what have we covered? The Polaritons from Cambridge University, uh, my group, the uh, low shadow group, uh, the, um, also is my colleague at Berkeley, and this is the group at Stanford uh, with the optical parametric oscillators and the completely different optical scheme coming from MIT that looks very different than the others, but nonetheless is, um, is minimizing the parent description and arriving at the correct answer. So uh, I said all of these approaches uh, minimum entropy generation, minimum power dissipation. Although the uh, the authors of each of these will challenge me on that, and they will actually be resentful because they would they want to be unique, and uh, I'm saying they're all the same. And uh, that the physical hardware to be a circuit implements uh, steepest descent physically, uh, and it sounds analog, but it's not because it produces a binary. I put, in fact, it's digital in the sense, same sense that a flip flop is digital. It's made of bistable components, and we'll give you a, a digital answer. Now, why would anyone want to do this? It's because the physics based hardware can perform the same functions at greater speed and with less power dissipation than conventional computation. The optimization methods I showed you at the beginning uh, with um, Matrix multiplication and like all of the Azure methods, so well, that's very computationally intensive. Here, the physics does the whole computation for you, and you arrive at the optimal. And uh, whether it's an optical machine, it's your choice. An optical machine, an electrical machine, they all uh, follow the same physics principle. And so, uh, if so, what can you gain? Uh, well, you can do uh, deep learning. And uh, this is for artificial intelligence. You'll be able to identify dogs and cats and images and many other things. And uh, you'll be able to lay out circuits and tax things and figure out how protein molecules fold. So the implications are that rather extensive. So the idea is the circuit would be very rapid, consume very little power and energy, and yet give you the same answer as a very complicated computational um, scheme. Uh, uh, nature is following steepest descent or steepest ascent. Uh, it sometimes gets stuck in local optimum. So the global optimum, there is no method that mankind made today that would guarantee uh, that we get a global optimum. These are called NP hard problems. And the reason why they're very hard is that a mathematician can always set it up so there is no way you could ever find it. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And following the gradient, if, it's, if they set up that way, following the gradient doesn't help. So uh, the, uh, that, that remains on itself. Uh, the most practical problems are not like that. And so you follow the gradient and you, you know, achieve the optimum. So, uh, Let's get some action items from this. So we have some insights we have here. What are the action items? So I, I made this presentation to a government group this morning, and I said that you must sponsor someone to design these two chips. Uh, one chip would have, uh, let's say, a thousand LC oscillators, and the other chip would have the resistor network. And the resistors have to be uh, quite accurate because they they determine the power dissipation. And but the good news is it is possible to manufacture very accurate resistors that's limited only by the ability to measure the ohms. If you can measure accurately, you can find the resistor. And, and, but you don't always have to figure out all the resistance values. You can, well, for example, you can program them in a binary array so that uh, you have a certain resistance value, then double, then quadruple, and then eight times, and so forth. Um, and um, on the, on the other hand, the icing problem only requires a single value. All the resistors have to have the same value. So um, uh, later on, we will 
have will write some software and will have compilers. So any particular problem, whether it's an airline problem, whatever, it will be translatable to the resistance value. So let me finish on that point and ask the questions. And if any of you are curious about what I've discussed, it's available online. We posted it about a week ago. Uh, and the title of it is, is that physics implements or going to multiply optimization. And that's the main point. And it's, it's an opportunity. It's a new way of doing computer science. I can assure you the computer scientists will not be happy with me because it's completely orthogonal to the way they have been plotted. And the way computers have been organized for the past 60 years. But I think there's an opportunity to reform computing. And you say, well, it's only part of computing because it's optimization. It's turning out that optimization is the most important part of computing. Today, every supercomputer is half a normal, uh, half a normal supercomputer, but the other half of it is optimization. So optimization is equal to um, so let me uh, pause for questions. And, um, okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yablomich. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I'll take up one by one. The first one is uh, Is there any possible solution for the easing problem, or an optimal solution doesn't exist? Well, there's always. Uh, an optimal solution is that there is some configuration such that there are no configurations that have lower energy. So, uh, the, the, uh, so uh, you can't, because it's the way it's set up, you cannot get uh, negative infinity energy. There's always the lowest energy. Uh, so, the problem is that the lowest energy might be extremely difficult to find. And by the time you get to uh, 200 cents, nobody has any way of finding the solutions. In fact, if you had a solver, there would be no way to confirm that it has actually reached the uh, lowest energy state because we, we literally don't know what it is. Uh, so uh, they, they solve, they tend to solve artificial problems where the solution is known in the past. But that's an idea of how hard these problems are. And this already becomes at, at 60 spins or a few hundred spins, you already have this problem. A few hundred magnets. You already have this problem. You, you have no idea what the correct solution is. And I don't think the method I'm describing will, is, a, is a way to guarantee the correct solution. Uh, what, we, uh, what we're describing will uh, give you a, a solution. It may not be the, the most perfect solution, but it will give you a very good solution very quickly and uh, satisfy any practical requirement. Uh, but if uh, mathematicians could always defeat the, the uh, physical machine by coming up with the problem that I can solve. So that's a caution. Okay. Okay. I'll take up the next one. Uh, in the example of magnetic interaction, if you take Kitty's model, when interactions are anisotropic, how does optimization work to take the frustration into account? Well, uh, the frustration would be just constraints. So you can, it, it's not that difficult to put constraints and particularly with the physical system as an electric circuit, it's very easy to put constraints in. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, if you throw a problem like that at me, I think I can come up with a circuit. But you know, in the long run, we want a compiler that whatever problem you throw at me, I can figure out exactly how to rearrange the circuit. So its power dissipation will exactly match what you are trying to achieve. Uh, so uh, we uh, think that these anisotropic interactions or frustrations among the magnets. What if you had a financial problem? That's even more difficult, and there's a lot more money involved. So you're trying to uh, uh, optimize a portfolio to notice some inefficiencies in the markets. If you do it right, you can become very wealthy. Well, those are even more difficult to translate into uh, the appropriate industry. So we have ways of doing it, but obviously it's, uh, as you get to more complicated cases, you need more automation just for designing the circuit. But thank you very much for the question. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, the next one is, 
uh, what is the motivation to present spin as RLC circuit as you have shown via spin 1 and spin 2 anti ferromagnetic cases? Okay, why use an electric circuit? Well, you could have used an optical circuit. Uh, you could have, there, there, and there's a number of different ways, optical circuits, a number of different electrical circuits. Uh, why can't we just leave it as magnets? So you can imagine a child leaving the magnets on the table, and surely the magnets will arrange themselves in the lowest energy configuration. But regrettably not. Uh, and in fact, you probably have to wait uh, forever uh, for, for the magnets to arrive in the lowest energy configuration. So that could be regarded as the physical annealing machine, but it just takes much too long. And uh, what has emerged in the past few years is that people have started using uh, physical machines to do this rather quickly to solve this problem rather quickly. And it's not magnets, but it's an analogy to magnets. And the analogy seems to be rather uh, rapid and potentially uses uh, very little uh, energy. And I mentioned why it uses very little energy. Uh, the, um, to to uh, arrive at the uh, lowest energy state, we have to dissipate energy to get there. Now, our systems, uh, the power dissipation systems, are seemingly continuously dissipating energy. So you think that they would use an infinite amount of energy because the power is not to be dissipated, because all these current don't really exist. But once you achieve the answer, you can turn the whole thing off. And if you do that, then you dissipate only a finite amount of energy. And it's very competitive with uh, other methods of computing and, and being energy efficient. In fact, it looks like it's one of the best ways of approaching the Landauer limit, which is a limit that was put forward by Dr. Landauer, who is the head of theory at uh, IBM for many years. Uh, he passed away some years ago, but uh, he put forward a limit what is the energy concentration on. Uh, ordinary computer approaches it within about a, a factor of a million. So computers are a million times worse than they could be. And I believe that the uh, power minimization machines, uh, they will not be exactly that. They, they, they won't get all the way to the one of our but we haven't uh, done it. Okay. Okay. It's a good question. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, the next one is glass problem be viewed as least entropy production? Will it be uh, configurational entropy? Yes, the glass problem is, is how I assume you're saying how the, uh, the atoms arrange themselves in the glass so they minimize their energy. And it's very similar to the Edison problem, uh, it's a similar sort of thing. And uh, they are trying to minimize the energy. And we are obligated to set up things, which nobody's done, because they're so happy with the ice problem, they don't know how to deal with the uh, other problems. But uh, undoubtedly, there's a way to set up a circuit problem that will uh, mimic uh, what atoms have to do in glass, which is to uh, arrange their positions to minimize energy. And, and so we do the circuit and we can use the environment. With the oscillators, uh, maybe uh, uh, two possible uh, positions in space, and there would be the two states of the actual binary states. So, that, uh, so that's uh, a further optimization problem. I promise you an unlimited number of optimization problems, and some of them are the great commercial, medical, financial importance. The glass problem is not one of them, neither is the icing problem, but they're nice problems to set up and you can write clear into that. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, the next one is the two raised power 31 connections has been tested on physical layers or in wireless connections as it depends on the spin of electrons. Well, the, uh, the spin was just a manner of speech. In fact, it, it's supposed to model uh, magnets, these magnets do not have to be spin. You know, I, I should really remove the word spin from my slides. Uh, it was just magnets. Uh, yeah. Just think of it as a child playing with magnets on the table. Okay. Uh, arranging as uh, the lowest energy configuration. 
child will have to sit there and learn that. Because in many cases, we simply don't have that. Okay. Uh, I'll take up the next one. There are a lot of companies working on application specific artificial intelligence optimizers using yes. electronic photonics methods. Yes. Which of these approaches have most uh, promising uh, upcoming in the future itself? Well, uh, the approaches that are currently being used in the field of computer science uh, are, are what's called back propagation. The mathematics is similar to what I showed you earlier in the talk, where you have a solution, an Android solution, and if you combine them, you can optimize, uh, for example, uh, the elements in the matrix that is used to operate in a photograph to determine what's in the uh, photograph. So uh, that, uh, that method is utterly standard in the field. Uh, method I spent most of the talk on, which was using physical machines, is completely new, uh, controversial, uh, not accepted yet. Uh, the people, the practitioners are at odds with each other because each thinks that they have the right way and everybody else is wrong. Uh, but uh, it looks like there might be a physics shortcut for solving some of these very hard uh, computational problems. And that's the exciting thing. Uh, impacting uh, a whole new branch of computer science. Do computer science in the world. That's where the exciting thing is. Okay. So I'll take up the last three questions now. Uh, the first one is why we use rods in air background instead of using silicon slab for photonic crystals 2D fabrication? Uh, well, I don't, uh, uh, I, I think maybe there was uh, confusion about what I showed on one of my slides. Uh, there, um, uh, it, it's just a planar silicon uh, circuit with a thin film of silicon. Uh, there are no rods in it. The, uh, uh, maybe you're thinking of the, uh, the 2D photonic crystal that is used for polarization beam splitting. Those are not rods. That is a simple two-dimensional pattern. In the so I hope that answers that question. Okay. Uh, the second last question. In your coupled oscillator solver, how the amplitude fluctuations of oscillator affect the optimal solution? Well, uh, that's a very good question because generally speaking, you have to arrange that the amplitude will be stable. Because in order for the power dispersion to match the energy, uh, it makes sense only if each oscillator is at the same amplitude. And so what you build into the oscillators is simply a circuit uh, that um, the, the, the uh, amplitude is, is simply saturated. So the gain pushes it to the point of saturation and then it's done. And so that becomes uh, a necessary part of the circuit in a way of introducing uh, a constraint. And the constraint is every operator could have exactly the same amplitude. Okay, so I'll take up the last question now. Uh, can you please explain how a joint method ends up calculating all derivatives in two simulations? That is a terrific question. That's the miracle of the adjoint method. Uh, but it is something that was uh, only recognized mathematically uh, in the period around the 1950s and was not broadly uh, distributed. So in each field, they have to rediscover the same mathematics over and over again. And so each field comes up with a different name for the same mathematics. There are still important areas of optimization where this method is not being used. So it's gradually penetrating into uh, various fields. Now, the question, how is it possible that by solving maximum equations only twice, that you get the derivative at all points of space, the derivative of the mirror function? That is the amazing thing. Unfortunately, it gets us too deeply into um, uh, mathematics, and you have to look at the adjoint matrices, and so on and so forth, but definitely well worth learning. And I wish I had learned that when I was an undergraduate, I think every undergraduate should be taught that it is not enough to learn ordinary calculus. You could learn calculus of large numbers of degrees of freedom. It's not that much more difficult once you know and, and, uh, once you know uh, linear algebra. So I recommend that um, uh, maybe this could become part of the undergraduate curriculum 
the people who are serious and and how useful will it be for the students to get a job in the computer science industry you now? And you have to know that that I think that that's the method uh, for uh, performing artificial intelligence. So every employer now wants uh, wants employees that are perfectly comfortable with doing artificial intelligence. And that's the uh, main mathematical step. So I cannot uh, describe the secret. Uh, it take a a whole, uh, you know, it would leave everyone uh, dissatisfied because it's actually very subtle mathematically. But uh, it's rather a miraculous piece of, piece of mathematics. And, uh, gradually penetrating into all of it. Uh, I should mention a funny story about that. I was asked to sit on a PC thesis committee of uh, an engine, a traffic engineer. And the student's assignment was to adjust traffic lights, which allow uh, traffic in Los Angeles to merge onto the freeways. You may uh, have heard that Los Angeles is very famous for having freeways, which are basically these very large highways with uh, ramps to get on. But uh, because of the jams, they put red lights on, and the student's uh, objective was to find the optimum pattern of turning the red lights on and off, or green lights on and off, to allow cars to join the freeway. Uh, and then he, he told me that there were, surprisingly, only 120 freeway ramps in Los Angeles. This is for truck because we, having lived in Los Angeles, it seems like there's no end of freeway ramps. There were only 120. And uh, uh, so at first I thought there's only 120 variables, but the, the uh, Ramp period changes every 15 seconds during rush hour. Rush hour could be three hours long. So you, you have a, a truly huge number of variables. And they're using exactly the same mathematics I'm describing here. Uh, in this case, you're optimizing the traffic in uh, Los Angeles with a, a, a great challenge. But uh, they were contracted to, to do it by the uh, California Department of Transportation. So uh, I believe every student should learn this type of uh, Optimization mathematics, a combination of calculus with analytics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yalunich. I request uh, Professor Khatak to kindly give some concluding remarks. That was a fascinating talk and uh... We are extremely grateful to Professor Yablonovich for taking the time late at night and to speak to all of us. There have been about 300 participants all through, which shows the tremendous interest that uh, our scientists have and students have in the topic that was discussed. So we are grateful to you and also to you, Manoj, and Gitika for organizing this lovely talk. Over to Manoj. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Professor Yablonovich, any concluding remarks from your side? Uh, then uh, I'll close the session. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for listening. It's uh, very inspiring to know that there are so many of you out there. And uh, I think particularly for the students, I've given you a clue, uh, bug your professors, learn about adjoint optimization. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yablonich. Thank you very much, Professor Kadak, and all the attendees who have uh, spared their valuable time for nearly an hour, uh, one and a half hour. In it was a very talk. enjoyable morning. It was a very enjoyable morning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I sure. hope to see many of you in person. Yes, definitely <laughs> next year. <laughs> you must come to India. You must come to India. <laughs> I have seen your. I have heard. I had heard that you had once been in TIFR in Mumbai. And it's been a long time. I think I'm ready to come again. Very good. We will be <laughs> eagerly look forward to. And I hope by then you get the Nobel. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll settle for a healthy trip to India. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm closing the session. Thank you very much.